Hi everyone, welcome again to our Pi Data event. I'm Patricia Schuster, one of the co-organizers, and our other co-organizers are here, Sean Law and Ben Zeitlin. Um, and today we are welcoming Medikin Monk. Um, so before I introduce Medikin, I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items for the group. So um, our, this group is sponsored by a few different organizations. NUM Focus sponsors our Meetup group. TD Ameritrade provides us with the space to gather, and Midas uh, pays for the dinner. And so if you know people from these organizations or if you see them, please say thank you for uh, funding our organization. A few important points, emergency exit. There is an emergency exit right here if we need it. Um, we're always looking for feedback on the organization, so if you have any thoughts, please share them either with us directly or through our Twitter account or through the Gmail account listed here. And then we're in our borrowed space, so please clean up after yourself. Um, so the way we do questions here is please hold your questions until the end of Medikin's presentation, unless they're very quick. Please phrase your question in the form of question and keep your questions to 30 seconds or less. And avoid long statements or monologues. And remember that we will have plenty of time for open discussions after the Q&A. Now I will read our code of conduct. Hi Data is dedicated to providing a harassment-free meeting experience for everyone regardless of gender, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, disability, physical appearance, body size, race, or religion. We do not tolerate harassment of meeting participants in any form. All communication should be appropriate for a professional audience, including people of many different backgrounds. Sexual language and imagery is not appropriate for any of our meetup events. Be kind to others. Do not insult or put down other attendees. Behave professionally. Remember that harassment and sexist, racist, or exclusionary jokes are not appropriate for Pi data. Attendees violating these rules may be asked to leave the meetup at the sole discretion of the meetup or organizers. Thank you for helping make this a welcoming, friendly event for all. So um, now we'd like to do a quick icebreaker so you can meet the people around you. Today's icebreaker is courtesy of Medikin. Uh, so please turn to your neighbor and introduce yourself and tell them a weird animal fact. Yeah, like a weird fact about your favorite animal. Yeah. Let's recon. Okay. Who can tell me uh, the weirdest animal fact that they heard? Nick. There are sulfur-based crabs in the bottom of the ocean. Sulfur-based crabs. Fascinating. According to Stephen Colbert, there are animals which have transient anuses that only appear when they need to use them, and then they disappear in the animal. Wow. Wow. All right. Convenient. <laughs> types of kangaroos. I didn't know. Didn't know. <laughs> All right, so thank you for doing that. Uh, so we also like to do a, this month in data science. So today we wanted to feature a piece that was written by Eric Colson at Stitch Fix, and it's called Beware the Data Science Pin Factory, the Power of the Full Stack Data Science Generalist, and the Perils of Division of Labor Through Function. And uh, it's a very interesting piece arguing that there's a lot of value in being a data scientist who can do all, all the different pieces of the puzzle rather than splitting the entire problem up into different steps and, and sending each step off to a different person. And, and he, uh, he visits a, a number of different aspects of that. Uh, I also want to mention our next event is on April 10th. Okay. Uh, Julia Signal, who will be speaking on visualizing and analyzing earth science data using pi vis and pi data. Also, there is a conference coming up called Not Another Big Data Conference here in Ann Arbor, <laughs> May 10th and 11th, hosted by Curtio Labs. Um, you may be interested in attending. Okay, are there any other community announcements before we begin the talk? Anyone looking for a job or looking to hire at their company that they want to make everyone aware of these positions? I'm uh, looking for a job. My name is I just uh, finished my master's. I'm like a uh, beginner in Python coding. So. Okay. Excellent. So a fresh master's graduate with Python coding skills looking for a job. Thank you. Thank you. So if anyone's interested, you can connect after the talk. Can I say one thing? Mm -hmm. One announcement? Uh, welcome back to everybody. Uh, this is our two year anniversary. Oh, so you know, oh, we're still around. Oh. Excellent. Okay, 
so now we will turn things over to Medikin. Medikin Monk is a postdoc in the Data Exploration Lab at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at uh, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Medikin received her PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in nuclear engineering. Wow. <laughs> and today she will be talking about YT, which is an open source data visualization package for mesh and point-based data. So take it away. Okay. Um, yes, so thank you for the wonderful introduction, Tricia. Um, my name is Medikin, as she said. Afterwards, if you'd like to talk to me, you can ask my name again. I know it's not the easiest name to remember, so that's fine. Don't worry about it. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, YT, which is a package that Trisha mentioned that's open source for visualizing um, generally volumetric data. But I'm also going to be talking about what we're doing to make YT interactive and uh, what solutions we have taken in the YT community to try and make it so we can make science and data more accessible for many different uh, pathways. So before I go too deep into YT, I want to say a little bit more about myself. So Trisha gave a great introduction uh, mentioning my PhD in nuclear engineering from UC Berkeley. Um, my work primarily in my PhD was to visualize, no, was to simulate radiation transport through space. And there, were, there are visualization tools that are very effective for um, uh, visualizing the data that I was using, but uh, there wasn't a lot of open source packages available. And so I really wanted to make sure that as I went on into my postdoc that I had the ability to visualize my data however I wanted and with as much fidelity as I wanted to. My work also for my PhD was done at Oak Ridge National Lab and as a member of the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. Now I'm at my postdoc at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, and I work in a group called the Data Exploration Lab. Some members of the Data Exploration Lab are core developers of YT, but the YT community is very broad and international. We have developers all over the world, and just a few of us uh, exist in the Data Exploration Lab. And in general, the Data Exploration Lab is about making data accessible in many different ways, whether that means transparent through open science or by making tools for visualization and uh, data analysis. I also am very active in various software communities. I am a member of the Carpentries community. I'm a software carpentry instructor and a data carpentry instructor. I'm also the maintainer of the, uh, of the Git novice lesson for software carpentry. So if any of you are really big Git aficionados, come talk to me because I'm a big fan. And uh, last, this uh, last logo here is the logo for the NUM Focus Committee for Diversity and Inclusion in Scientific Computing. And uh, I'm on this committee. I'm very proud of the work that we do. The subcommittee I'm on actually works with doing assessments of diversity and inclusion. And also, um, we maintain the Discover Cookbook, which is a series of tips to make uh, events more accessible and inclusive. And so if you want to go here, uh, we have lots of different um, tips. There's high impact, high effort, um, high impact, low effort. And so we try to categorize things to make it easy for different events. Um, I also am very active in the SciPy community. If any of you are going to SciPy this summer, I would love to see you. I will be there. And uh, I also am a core developer of YT, which lives in the scientific Python ecosystem. OK, so now I've given you this super long introduction. We can move into YT, the exciting part. Um, I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction to YT, and I'll give you the link to the slides afterwards. So um, if you're really interested in some of the stuff that you see, uh, the, the, these are links that lead to the project website and the repository, and there's a lot of really great uh, documentation on all of the different types of plots that you're going to see today. So in general, what YT does is takes data from all different types of visualization packages. So these are just some of the ones that, we've, uh, that we can pull ingest data in. We pull it in based on bespoke custom front ends that exist for each one of them, because each data, visual, data simulation package that you might use outputs data in a different way. It might be on a regular structured mesh. It might output pointwise data. And so we have to be able to accept data from many different formats. Um, because you can have volumetric data in many 
um, accessible for many different places. So we ingest that into YT and we put it into custom YT data objects and then we can output that into different visualizations or different analyses. So we can filter data, we can get different, um, you know, uh, parameters that the that YT can calculate um, that might be interesting to you. YT was born in the astronomy and astrophysics ecosystem, so much of what YT and you're going to see today is based on astronomy and astrophysics data. But we are actively trying to move into like the broader scientific community, and so I'll kind of mention our efforts there as I go through in this talk a little bit more. I mentioned that we have, uh, we have to accept data in many different types, and uh, volumetric data can exist in, uh, in sort of different ways. So we can um, pull in data from octbase meshes, which is uh, data that's like refined in different types of octants, and you refine um, more and more based on some parameter that's interesting. So if you see like a density gradient in your simulation that uh, you think might have interesting physics, the mesh will refine in that octant, but only in that place. So that way you can refine in areas that are important and have a coarse mesh in more unimportant areas. We also can accept data from structured regular meshes. These are things that, uh, like a lot of nuclear engineering simulation packages use structured regular meshes. It's just like a typical sort of, you know, regular mesh where you might have something in X, a mesh in X, and a mesh in Y, and it's the same for all X and Y. Then we have unstructured meshes. This is something that you might see in like a CFD simulation or something like that, something that can go around. Uh, round objects uh, often is an unstructured mesh, and then also particle data. And so we've been actively trying to make uh, YT accept all these different types of uh, volumetric data, and that's also challenging because each one of them may uh, look different in a YT data structure. And so as we move forward into more domains, this is something that we actively have to be cognizant of as we develop more. We also have a variety of visualization types. And you'll see some of these as we go through. We can slice in the domain in whatever ordinate you want, so X, Y, or Z. We can also do projection plots. So you can take, uh, you might want, you might have a plot in X and Y and it integrates through all of Z. That would be a projection plot. A profile plot is something in 2D that you might get an average of something over uh, one of your dimensions. Um, and a phase plot is another version of that. And then um, we can also do 3D surfaces and isocontours. So if you want to know about like some version of density in your, um, like where the density in some part of your simulation is, like if you want this constant density, you can get the isocontour of that density. And we also have supporting analysis routines. So I mentioned before that we don't just do visualization, we can do analysis so we can get derived fields. So you might have a field of mass and you might have a field of velocity and we can make a derived field of momentum because we have the mass and the velocity fields. We can do clump finding, which involves uh, looking at uh, like, you know, you can choose something along density and you can find the clump of where those densities exist. Um, we can filter data, so we can filter data below or above a certain parameter if you're interested in that, and then also do profiles and histograms. Um, so I mentioned that the project website is really uh, good at showing examples of this. I didn't actually want to like re-put them in here. So we can see some of these, so we can see what a projection plot looks like through um, the domain. So this is a slice of our sample data through Y with density. Um, we can also look at what a slice plot looks like with the same data. And you can see it like smooths out as you do this integral through space. Um, we can also do interaction. So this doesn't actually uh, have the interaction, but we, uh, we do have a volume interactive rendering that is available. But today I'm not going to talk too much about that. Okay. We also um, have, oh, I think that, there we go. So this is an example of something that we might do with YT. This is one of my um, collaborators, one of the other developers of YT, Nathan Goldbaum. He did a large simulation of a formation of a galaxy in space. And um, this is several terabytes of data that he had to process. And this is a galaxy formation driven by many different physics, including star formation and self-gravity. And you can see that uh, there's many, so first of all, there's many frames here. You have to process a lot of data. This is also projecting through density. So um, 
we might have, uh, so you might have something that, uh, so you might have to collapse all your data through the z-ordinate with density and then process each time step. And so you can, YT has the ability to process lots and lots of data at a time. But so also YT can output data to different extension packages. So you just saw a regular plot from YT with Nathan's data. This next uh, video is um, using YT to output to something called Houdini, which is a visual effects software um, that's like volumetric. And the, the NCSA has a um, group called the Advanced Visualization Lab, which makes out outreach videos for scientists and based on scientific data. And so with Houdini and YTini, which is our extension package uh, that connects YT and Houdini, um, we can take sci real scientific data, give it to artists, and then these artists can render it and make it beautiful for science outreach. And so you can see this is this formation of the same data. Yep? Yeah, quick question. Uh, yeah. On the video you showed a few yeah. minutes ago, mm -hmm. I know it's a video, but mm -hmm. I, is YT doing effectively, I know it's an outer space example, mm -hmm. but effect, you know, particle physics calculations in real time? No, so YT is doing the post-processing of this data. So that, I don't remember exactly which um, software Nathan used um, to simulate that. So it's doing the display. It's doing the display, right. It's processing the data afterwards. So you get like all of the physics and stuff from some simulation code that you use, and then you can use YT to post-process that. Yeah, exactly. So we have many YT extension packages, and YTini is one of them. You can see this great logo, which has the martini. But there's also some that we output to make synthetic observation data. So there's x-ray data and things like that, and that's what some of these other ones do. If you're interested, these are all linked also. So in the presentation later, you can look through that. So I've kind of talked, I've given you a very brief overview of all the features of YT and uh, not all of them, but like, you know, some important ones that may be interesting to you. As we move forward in YT, we really want to expand um, the applicability of YT to other domains. And so we want to make a domain context system. Many things that are left over in YT are uh, relevant to astrophysics and astronomy, but maybe aren't super relevant to a nuclear engineer or a geologist or a climate scientist. Um, I don't know what the Hubble constant is. Maybe somebody else can tell me. Um, so we're trying to isolate and modularize YT to make it more applicable to different domains. Um, and so as we modularize it, we'll have analysis packages that are unique to each domain that YT is building support for. We also want to make some path traversal and non-local analysis and a symbolic field system. And I'll talk through e what each of these mean in a second. So in the domain context, we're targeting several fields. So first, weather and climate. And on the right here, this is a, a simulation of the formation of a tornado done from somebody at the University of Wisconsin. We're also um, targeting oceanography and hydrology. And this is, uh, uh, I think it's, so it's a simulation of ocean currents off the coast of Massachusetts. So you can see uh, Massachusetts is in the white space here. I always miss it, so. Um, also, whole earth seismography and tomography. This is an image of uh, the uh, seismic waves after the Tohoku earthquake, which uh, created Fukushima. Um, and so uh, that like started the meltdown and stuff like that. And so this is uh, a whole earth simulation of the ricochet of seismic waves through the earth. And also uh, observational astronomy. So we have all these simulation packages, but also observational data is still multidimensional in space. So we'd like to make it applicable to observational astronomy. Nuclear engineering, as you can imagine, I have some expertise there. And also neuroscience. And so we want to be able to read in MRI and X-ray data. And so all these images actually have been created with YT, but these are very cutting edge, not in uh, released versions of YT yet. Um, I want to give you an example of some other things we've done. So I built in some support for geographic projections so we can use this climate data and weather data and project it depending on what types of maps or projections we're interested in. So this is a global weather simulation. Um, I downloaded the data from NASA um, with an orthographic projection. And then I did the same image with a Robinson projection. Uh, and this is for, I think, August uh, 22nd, 2018. So this is an entire day's worth of weather 
Um, and I think it's the air density. No, oh, yeah, the axis says that. We also want to make some, um, so we're also, we have an open pull request for a CF compliant front end, which is uh, NetCDF, which is a standard data format for climate and weather. Um, and so these are some examples of data that have been pulled in from uh, radar simulations. And so uh, we have three different variations of this radar data, both projected and sliced through the simulation. And also, I mentioned medical imaging, and these are something done by somebody in our group named Sam Walkow, and she has been working on building in support for MRI data. And so um, we can see slices, and also this is an average through the entire skull on the far left-hand side over here. And this is, I asked her why this uh, data is missing here, and apparently the eyes are still um, important in images like this, and so it's to preserve the patient's privacy. So, yeah, today I learned. Um, so also we want to do path traversal and non-local analysis. So we can slice through X or Y or Z, and we can also do an ar arbitrary vector through space. But it would be interesting to look at how um, data in our domain changes given an arbitrarily defined path. And so we're building in support to be able to do that, to traverse at any point, any random points through our data and get those, get whatever the data points are that we're interested in. Um, also, we want to revise our, our field system. So I mentioned that we can make these um, derived fields based on like mass and velocity, but we're restructuring the field system to be uh, based on their base units. And so you can detect whatever available um, fields you can create from it based on its units in the unit system. So YT is great and it can do lots of different things. Um, and it also is really, really good for making publication quality plots. And data visualization and interactivity, interactivity complement one another. We, uh, as we like look through our data, we might have a very large simulation and there might be a point in our data that is very interesting to us, but we don't know where it is yet, right? And so we need to do either analysis on that data to find where those interesting points are and usually we need to have interactivity to browse through that, right? Like we might be able to say, okay, where is like the highest temperature region in my simulation or where is the lowest density region? But it might be a little bit more complicated than that. So um, this is an example of somebody in our group's work, um, not in our group at NCSA, but somebody who works on the YT project, Britton Smith, and he simulated the formation of a population two star, which is, a second generation star. It has interesting, some an interesting, slightly uh, light elements, uh, mostly light elements. And on the, he made this with both using YT and also he did a lot of customization of the plots with Matplotlib. And so you, this is a huge simulation, several terabytes of data, and he and many time steps. And I talked to him about how he made this video and he said it was very difficult for him because he had to go and find these interesting points and to make the video he had to choose what the camera angle was and update it at every time step. He's also doing interpolation between the data between each frame because he has so many time steps and then he has these, uh, he wants to make it smooth. So he has all this, he's also, this just switched on the one side from temperature to um, the, the metallicity, so like what the composition of the star is. And so he had to update that and also in time, the interesting point might change, right? Like at time zero, your, the interesting point in your data might be located at one point and at time Z, it might be um, something, it might be at a different point. And so we need interactivity to be able to find this. And so this is what we're trying to do now with uh, widgets. I'm gonna move out of the slide. So interactivity allows for on the fly parameter tuning. So we can adjust our color maps. Maybe we can see that like there's an interesting area, but it's skewed by whatever color map we have. Maybe we wanna change the, the scale of it. Maybe we wanna change the view. So we are zooming in on that point, or maybe we wanna change uh, the width of the view or something like that. But it also allows for exploration. We can find all, all of this interesting stuff in our data if we have interactivity, but we can't do that if we just have to keep rerunning the same Python script, changing something a little bit every time, right? That can get very annoying, and I think probably all of us have had to do that at some point in our, in our lives. I definitely had to do it. 
Um, and it reveals the interesting science. But also, in, separate from ourselves, it allows science to be accessible. If we can make our data interactive and we can allow people to invest, like explore it themselves, we can do a lot of outreach, right? We can make our data accessible to non-scientists, to people who might like be interested in what the temperature of a nuclear reactor is at this particular point, right? And you can show them like what the reactivity is, or maybe you want to show them this climate model and they want to browse and like look what the temperature in Denmark is at one point and compare it to what the temperature in Texas is. And so all of this interactivity is very important and it allows us to do outreach to non-scientists, but also to those people who di don't identify as hackers. There's a lot of people who don't really enjoy coding and don't enjoy uh, this very um, fun process of adjusting and rerunning your Python script every uh, five minutes, right? And so it allows you to work with your collaborators who also might not be as interested in um, getting in down into the nitty gritty of software development as you might be. And last, to those that are new to the data. So maybe you have run a simulation, you're passing it on to your collaborator, and they want to explore it themselves. Rather than you saying, look at exactly at this point, you can give them the data and they can explore it on their own if they have the right tools to do so. There's a lot of tools that already exist in the scientific Python ecosystem that um, make science more accessible. Um, and I, this is just a few of them, and not all of them are scientific Python, but I've tried to focus it on that. And actually, uh, I think next month's talk or next week's is using PyViz, which is right here without the image. Uh, but so you can see that this is something that people care about, right? You want to be able to use interactive tools. So what we want to do with YT is make a Jupyter widget. And so how many of you have heard of or have used Jupyter widgets before? Great. OK, so like half. So OK, we're going to do also a brief introduction of Jupyter widgets. I'm not going to dive too deep, but you'll kind of see an example of what they look like. So I want to say also that this is specifically what I'm going to be talking about with this interactivity is specific to YT and using interactivity with YT. All those things I showed on the previous slide are helpful for interactivity with other packages. And so if you're really interested in a different package, you can like look through whatever interactive features they might have as well. So first, this is in the first cell, I'm just going to load, um, in general, a bunch of things that are dependent, just to give you an example of what it looks like to use standard IPy widgets with YT and see what that looks like. So that's why I have to load all these things like IPy widgets and IPy data widgets. And now I'm going to load a, um, a data set that's in our sample data called Isolated Galaxy. This is a very, very basic isolated galaxy in space. Um, and so you'll see it's going to be just centered at one point, and there's nothing else around it. So I'm going to load that. And YT returns some stuff telling us about the domain and what it looks like, so what the left edge and the right edge looks like, and whether um, there's time, if there's a timestamp or something like that. So this next cell is really big, and that's because I'm building up a couple of different things to make my visualization interactive using YT. So I have the, I have the same uh, YT load, and then I have uh, some traitlets that I'm setting. These are listeners that you can set um, that work with IPy, with IPy widgets that you can update, and then you can link them back and forth as you, uh, interact, with, with, uh, as you interact with the data. And then I'm going to have some observers. So I want to look at my view center at x and y. So I'm observing that. And if that changes, I have to update my image. And then I'm going to observe the width, which is uh, corresponding to how far I'm zoomed in or out. And so I have this width listener with the traitlets observing. And the, then I have some on change functions here. So what these are doing is if I notice a change in these, I'm triggering this function to be called. So those are nice little traitlet decorators. And then I have uh, some, fl I'm making some sliders down here with IPy widgets. So that's what's happening here. This is a float slider with each of the center X, Y, and then the width. So that's my zoom. And then, and then I'm going to return that in a box. And so I'm going to have um, these things. It's going to take a little bit because it's doing a couple different things. So it's telling me I'm making a fixed resolution buffer down here, and then I'm gathering a field list. And that's because when we load in this data, YT will detect whatever fields exist. So you might have 
uh, many different fields that exist on the mesh that's in, defined in your data. So YT can read all of those in, and then it will detect them, and so you can see a field list as you go through it. So this is isolated galaxy, um, and we can play around with it. So this is my zoom. I can zoom in. It's kind of slow. You can see there's a major lag here. It's still updating even after I've stopped dragging. I'm moving X and Y. And you can see that there's a lot of lag here, and that's because every time I'm moving through, uh, oh, and so now there's, I'm getting, uh, YT is telling me it's making this, and I overfilled my buffer now, so that's why we, uh, now we've filled out the cell, but that's fine. Um, and so you can see that um, that was actually really slow, and that's because every time we're doing this, we have a lot of data, and every time we trigger one of these events, we ask YT to recalculate the image and then send it back to us, right? So what this looks like, so imagine also if instead I'm of being just on my laptop, I have a large data set on a supercomputer or a remote server that I'm working with. Um, I have my laptop that's running YT, you can see, very effective. Uh, and I send my request to that server um, to generate this new image. And then what the computer or the remote server is going to do is actually going to generate the image itself on that side and then serialize the image and then send it back to me. And then I'm going to pull that image back onto my computer and then my computer will display it, right? And so you can imagine as you trigger each one of these events and you do this many, many times, you can have a lot of lag. And you're really dependent on a lot of different um, parameters when you're doing that. So when might this become cumbersome? So uh, you have the time to send the signal to your server. You have the time to serialize and deserialize the image, which can take uh, quite a bit of time. The time to calculate the image, and depending on how fine of a resolution you have, that can take some time. Also the time to pull it from the server back to your machine. And then also the time to display it on your machine. And then also you have n interactions. So that's just a single image, right, each one of those times. So that's one that like you can do this hundreds and hundreds of times as you're going through if you just use like regular widgets or if you just are rerunning your script many times, right? So what if instead we did something a little different? Instead of sending a request and then having our server recalculate the image every time, we could just send all the data back to our machine and have our machine, our local machine, do all the calculations on its side rather than sending it back and forth to the server all the time. We can do that. We, this is something that you can do, and you can calculate the image in your browser using a Jupyter Notebook. And this makes sense if you can make the time to calculate and display that image on the client side in your browser less than the time to generate it on the server. So I've given a kind of pseudo uh, equation here. Uh, so we have so we still have the number of times to generate the image, but we only have the time to calculate it on the client side. That's the only thing that we have to multiply that n interactions by. On the right-hand side, we have to multiply n times the time to ge generate it on the server, but also to keep transferring that image divided by the data transfer rate. And so uh, we instead can have a fixed upfront cost where we have the data, the amount of data that we're sending from the data set and that data transfer rate. And then we only have to send, um, well, we only spend time recalculating the image on the client side rather than sending it back and forth every time, right? And how might this happen? So as you increase the number of interactions, I've hinted at this many times, like as you have N going up and up and up, eventually, <laughs> You can eventually you're gonna like have transferred way more data by just interacting with your image than you ever would have had you sent your data to the browser. You also can increase uh, the amount of space that the image is taking up. So you can imagine if you have like a 30 terabyte data set, it's gonna take a really long time to like get 30 terabytes of image data sent back to your computer, right? That's gonna be like insane. Um, but if you this might, I will give an example in a second, but as you increase the image size, for example, you're increasing the amount, of the amount of data that the image is taking up. And you might need a fine resolution to be able to do your exploration. And so as you increase the data of the image size, you also uh, are making it more import or more helpful to push to the client. You can also decrease the time that it takes to generate an image on the client side. And I'll talk a little bit how we address this using YT widgets. So I mentioned this uh, parameter of like the, 
the data of the image size, right? And in the beginning, I talked a little bit about different types of mesh data that we can read with YT. This is an example of uh, adaptive mesh data set. And this is a slice through uh, like a, a cosmological simulation. And you can see that in certain parts of the simulation, you have a very coarse mesh. And then in other parts, you have a finer mesh, right? So I can do a mesh overlay, and I can see what that looks like. And you can see, again, that there are certain parts where you have a much finer mesh, and you can't even see the like, most refined parts of the mesh, right? And so in, especially in cases like this, it becomes very helpful to push your data to the browser. Because you, have, you might have uh, regions of your data space that are extremely coarse, and that you don't have to like, worry about sending that data back and forth all the time because you only have one value for this huge space, right? So if you have like a 2,000 by 2,000 image that you're sending back and forth, that might be 100 by 100 right here, and you're sending that single value hundreds and hundreds of times. So um, you can imagine as you get a finer and finer refinement, you're going to increase the size of this image and also make it more and more difficult to interact with your data without using some sort of client-side calculations. So I have an example of instead using our, pack, our custom package widgets, which does this. Widgets calculates the image in the browser instead of doing it on the server side. So this is the same data set, except I'm going to use the widgets package. So um, before, I was using IPy widgets, or IPy um, data widgets, no, IPy widgets. And widgets with YT um, is our custom widgets package for YT. So I'm going to take a little bit. And we have, so also I would like to say that the widgets package is very proof of concept. And it's very much in early development. So if any of you are interested or think that there's more features we could add, please come talk to me afterwards. Because we really, this is like a new space that we're expanding in, in YT. So our first image, you don't see much, but I can switch the color scale. And I switched it to log now. And I can see the lower and upper, upper color bar the maps and stuff like that. I mean, I can zoom in. And you can see this goes way faster than when, when I was working with um, the standard widgets before. And that's because I have the entire um, slice of this data in my browser right now, and I'm using the browser itself to recalculate the image. So if I want, I can change the color map. So I can change it to like plasma or something like that. My browser has all the tools to be able to recalculate that image and regenerate it with this new color map. Because I pushed that, all of that information, all that functionality to the browser. Um, I also, so I showed, I tried to be a little transparent up here with what we're pushing exactly. So we have an x, y, and a dx and dy value to say what the mesh widths and um, stuff are. But we also have, so if you have widgets loaded and you just use display, we've uh, overridden the display function in YT that you actually automatically get the widget displayed if you have widgets on. So this is exactly the same one with a slice through the data set. I could also make a projection. So I'm going to integrate, uh, I'm going to make a density projection through Z with the same data set. And we can see it's going to look a little bit smoother than the other one. And if I zoom in, we can look at that and see what it looks like. I can also, so we also have added mouse events. So I can click in here and it adjusts everything. I can also drag the image and go really quick. So maybe I like, you know, I see something interesting here and I want to zoom in on it. I can recenter it just by clicking there and zoom in as far as I want. Okay. So you can see that once you push things to the browser, you can do things a lot quicker. So that's an example of using widgets. So what does this mean? Like I've shown you what it kind of looks like um, and I've hinted at what we've been doing. And what we're doing is with a single fixed upfront cost, we eliminate the requirement to transfer all of those images. All we're doing is now we have a requirement to calculate the number of images using tclient. And I'll talk about in a second how we try to reduce tclient. I mentioned also that this is useful in some, but not all cases. If you have a very refined mesh and the amount that you're uh, like you know you're not going to need a ton of interaction. You're not going to do a ton of perturbations on it. 
it's probably not going to be necessary for you to be using widgets at all. Like you could be rerunning your Python script on its own, or maybe you could even be doing it with uh, uh, using the server because you need the computing power of the server to be able to um, process through the data. Right? We can have some still. We still have some limitations that widgets can limit for us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about now what Widget does and um, how we do this. So I mentioned that with widgets, when we're pushing things to the client side, we have to reduce that T client. And we've done that through a series of different choices that we've made. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening. So um, we have YT. And we pass all these different values that you saw in the previous notebook. We have our mesh, our px, py, and then the width in x and y, and then also the data values. And then we pass this into our um, widgets function. Uh, and it used to be called yt pi canvas, but this is actually the widgets black box, yellow box. Um, so, you know, that's how you would use it, but you're going to learn what's inside it rather than uh, thinking of it as a simple box thing. So we pass that in, and we have some objects that are written um, in Rust that have been targeted to WebAssembly. WebAssembly is very fast and performant. And so that's what's actually doing these recalculations of the image. And so we pass those values into something called the fixed resolution buffer viewer, which is one of the sub-widgets in the widgets package. And then we have a variable mesh. And the variable mesh is uh, one of the data structures that exists in WebAssembly. And then the fixed resolution buffer is allocated, and it is uh, whatever the image is. So we allocate the image size in the pixels and width and height. So we send, so we send that data into the fixed resolution buffer viewer. So we've allocated it, and we've, we have the data in, stored in this object called the variable mesh. And we send that data array then to the normalizer, which then takes that data puts it now based on this like mesh size, whatever that's supposed to be, and sends it to, uh, like re gives it RGBA values using whatever color map that you select. And also um, the scale, whether it's linear or log, and then what the min and max values are. So that way you have the bounds of your color map. And then the normalizer sends, rather than a data array, it sends an image array back, and that's deposited in the fixed resolution buffer. And then we get a rendered image out. And so that's what the widgets package is doing, is we're sending these things. So this is Python. Once we pass it into the widgets package, we have it through, we like put it into JavaScript. Then this here is WebAssembly. So it's gone through three different uh, languages at this point. We have Python, JavaScript, and then WebAssembly. And then some of these things, we don't have to like re-sync. Like the WebAssembly objects then can calculate on the WebAssembly objects. We don't have to sync back and forth with JavaScript unless we need to. So how does it work? OK, so I just showed you how the first render works. So what happens when we change the color map? So we change the color map name. We have our, um, we have our normalizer widget, which changes stuff, right? And so the data array hasn't changed because the data, our view looks exactly the same. So we don't have to change anything in the data array. But the normalizer then is going to recall the normalization because it sees that one of these traitlets, the color map name, has changed. And it's going to update the image array. And it's going to update the rendered image. And then we're going to see a new image in the browser. OK, so that's like a simpler one, because we, we didn't have to go through everything, right? We were just changing stuff in the normalizer. If we do a canvas interaction, so let's say we, cha let's say we do a zoom, then we change the view width, right? Because we might have some scale of our view that we're looking through. So we're changing the view width. As a result, um, our fixed resolution buffer allocation changes. Whatever space we're looking at is going to change now, because we're looking at a different point in our data. So that's going to change. And then the data array is going to change, because we're passing it back into the normalizer. So whatever point uh, of our data, whatever data needs to be normalized is going to need to change. So the normalizer recalculates it, sends a new image array back to the viewer, and then we get a new rendered image. <coughs> So I mentioned that we have these WebAssembly objects. And uh, why did we choose WebAssembly? So WebAssembly is really fast. It's much faster than JavaScript in general. But it's been designed, actually, to work with JavaScript. Um, it's also like binary. Um, and so we can 
have all our data stored in WebAssembly, but not have to sync back and forth with like JSON objects or something like that. It's a sandbox memory environment, so we have some safety there. And we're, as a result, we reduce T client with WebAssembly. And why did we choose Rust? So there's many different uh, programming languages that you can use and you can compile to WebAssembly. You can compile to WebAssembly with like C or C++, I think. Um, but we chose Rust because it was safe. Um, I personally was new to all of these languages, and so I was kind of choosing which one would be interesting. Um, Rust is a really new sort of ecosystem, and they're doing a lot of work in the WebAssembly, the Rust and WebAssembly sphere, and so that was really interesting to see. Um, it's very performant. It's on par uh, with other really high-performance computing languages. And the community itself was very welcoming to new sort of WebAssembly-based projects. So I want to kind of mention a little bit about like how we got the WebAssembly objects compiled from Rust. So on the Rust side, we like make our we make our structures and we define them. And so like there's a lot more to the code, but we have these. Um, these sort of decorators at the top of the structure. And so we say, this is something that I want to bind, that I want to be able to access with WebAssembly through JavaScript. So I'm making this WASM bind gen uh, uh, like comment at the top. And so then when I target and when I compile it, on the JavaScript side, I get an automatically compiled JavaScript uh, file that's made when I target and I make this WebAssembly, and then I can call these functions um, on jo from JavaScript once I, it's compiled. Also, there's something called WASMPack. This is what we use to compile our Rust to WebAssembly, and it's very easy. So we, uh, so it takes our Rust object and it compiles and it puts it in a packaged environment that we can just upload straight to NPM. And so it makes it very, very easy for us. We don't have to do a ton of work. And it also makes it very accessible. And so this is an example of exactly what I do when I'm about to do a new release of our, um, of our, uh, our Rust to WebAssembly side of the widget. So I say WAS and pack init, and then I have our scope because we release all our packages within the group lab. And then it compiles everything um, for me. And then I have a .pkg directory, and that has my WebAssembly objects and my JavaScript linking already set up for me. OK, so now I have another demo. So I showed you um, some of our sample data with uh, Isolated Galaxy, and which is like a sample data set that we use all the time. Um, we also, so you saw that video before of the POP2 prime simulation, which is this formation of this population 2 star. That was the video with uh, two images side by side. So that data is accessible. Britton Smith made his data available um, publicly, so anybody can download it. So um, here is an example of using widgets with POP2 prime through the densest location in the um, in the data set. And so we, we have done the pre-processing of this to make it a little easier if you want to play around with it. Um, also, I should say that the first, so you only see the image after I interact with the widget because the first image that's created is empty. And so it's not till you interact with the canvas in some way that you'll see the first rendered image. So OK, here we go. So here's POP2 Prime. This is a slice through the data set. I think this is like. You know, it's not too big, but it's on the order of tens of megabytes, and I'm playing around with it, so I can update the limits of the color bar. Maybe I want to go 22. There we go. So I can interact with that. I can go up or down in the slice. This is an adaptive mesh refinement simulation, and so it's going to have several orders of magnitude of mesh refinement. So I'm going to make a zoom slider. Our zoom slider on this one is linear, so it's not going to be super interesting to look at. So now I can play around with this zoom slider and look at what, the is, what this is going to look like instead. So, so you can see that updating. I'm going to try and zoom out a second. So maybe you can see that a little bit. Yeah, OK, there we go. There we go. So we can like play around with that a little bit. We can also link, because we have all these things set up as traitlets, we could link that. So that was a density um, 
figure. Now I'm going to link a density and temperature plot side by side. Okay, so on the left is density, on the right is temperature. And I, you can see that it's maintained the density plot. Well, now it updated because I played it hit it. But this kept the same lower and upper color bar values from the previous plot because it kept all of those attributes. So now if I interact with one of these, both will update because I've linked them. So this way you can explore parts of your data set but still interactively browse based on multiple fields, right, which is pretty cool. So that's a slice. A projection is much bigger. So this is like 200 megabytes. And we're going to do a projection plot of the same data set. And this is a really long cell, but it's doing everything that I just did in the previous one. So I have my density and my projection data that I'm passing into our um, widget. I'm linking the center and the width and whether the color bar is log. And then I'm set making a slider and then setting some things with the temperature color map. OK, here we go. And so this is a little slower. Again, we still get some slowdown because like, as the data gets bigger, it just gets harder to interact with. Oh, I think I, oh, I was playing with the linear scale. See, not smart. This is the one I'm playing with. There we go. There we go. So, um, and so this is like kind of what Britton was doing when he was looking at his data. Is he was looking for interesting, like a very dense part as the um, star was being formed. And so you can like zoom in on it. You can update the color map immediately. So I could change this down. Maybe now I know I'm at a more interesting part. So I can live update that. On the right-hand side, so this col the, these controls are just controlling one side. But because I have traitlets, I can still update this color map if I want to. So um, the, I named this FRB Proj T. This is the map name, which is Inferno. I'm going to change it. Does anybody have a favorite terrible color map? You can see how horrible it's going to look. <laughs> hot pink. Hot pink is great, man. OK, well, we can see what Jet looks like to start with. OK, so there's Jet. Um, I, one of my favorites is Doom, which is the color map from the video game, which looks terrible. Uh, so that's going to be great. I mean, this is what you should use for all your science. Just telling all of you. <laughs> um, so you can see still, like we still have some performance things. As you get larger and larger data that you're pushing to the browser, it could still be difficult. So the limitation of the widget. Um, so we haven't done a ton of, so because this is still very uh, proof of concept, we haven't done any like memory limiting calculations. We're pulling that entire data set into our browser. And so that is, a lim that is our limitation. So like that was like 200 megabytes that I pulled straight into my browser. Um, so like is because it's a slicer projection, right? If we are not loading the full three-dimensional data set because we're still only browsing in X or Y. And so that's actually a limitation. Our widget only, it right now, requires just a 2D data slice. You can't browse in 3D. If you do want to browse in 3D, then you would have to do a new selection, and then you have to go back to transferring your data from the server back to your client. Um, there's a potential limitation for data sizes. So uh, as you can imagine, you're limited by whatever memory you have on your machine. And so we have, we have some limitations with whatever we're doing. However, this is a very large data set. The original thing is like, um, I think like each one, each time step was something like 200 gigabytes. And so a projection is 200 megabytes. So we order that, we, we reduce that by an order of magnitude or more than an order of magnitude. Now I'm like second guessing myself. Yes. Yeah? Uh, no, OK. So I, I will get to questions at the end. I know. I'm really excited that you're into it. Um, there's limited functionality. You saw we can update the color map, and we can drag and drop and stuff. Um, but we still don't have like a ton of functionality. Like we can't uh, you know, select data and like make a new plot from our data selection or anything yet. It's very, very proof of concept. And it requires maintenance in multiple package ecosystems and languages. We have to manage stuff in Rust. We have to manage stuff in JavaScript because IPy widgets are based on JavaScript. We had to write a lot more JavaScript than you normally would have to with a widget. And we also have to manage stuff with Python. And it's still early in development. And so like as a result, it's going to be buggy. 
And I put in the last one, the tools are new. So like the Rust and WebAssembly group is very good. But it's still, uh, like their stuff is also limited because they're actively developing all of these packages as well. So moving forward, we'd like to broaden the functionality of the widget. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you about this because I know I'm running out of time. Um, so I'm happy to talk to any of you about like where we want to go with it and if you have any suggestions. Um, in particular, I want to highlight we want to make it reproducible. So like you can browse around in this, but it would be very hard to know exactly where you were unless you knew all the trait objects that we've implemented. So we'd like to make something that returns all these values to you. So that way you can say, I browsed in our data. This is where I got. And then you can send it to your collaborator so then they can make that exact state and reproduce it on their machine. Um, there, here's some links. Um, and so I will give you the link to the slides in a second. But all of these are helpful links if you're interested in developing a widget like this on your own. Um, the Rust YT tools is our web, uh, Rust to WebAssembly package. That is outside of the main um, widgets release. This is like a, an assistant package that we've built with that works with the widgets. Um, so then the widgets repository is second. Um, the data in the paper for um, the POP2 prime data set is this one. So this is Britain's stuff. These are the filtered data that we made to do this, um, to do the example that I just showed you. So the ju so if you want to play around with these and you don't feel like installing a Python environment or maybe you're still lukewarm about widgets and you just want to look at them, we have uh, this link here is going to bring you to like a launch pad that will uh, make a Jupyter notebook in an isolated environment for you that you can play around with the widgets exactly with the data that I just showed you. Um, and so then there's some other stuff about REST and WebAssembly and stuff like that. You can install the widget with pip install. And I'd like to thank especially Patricia and Sean Law for bringing me out here. Um, also Matt and the YT developers because it's like an amazing package. I'm still learning stuff about it every day. And I'm like amazed at some of the stuff that it can do. And uh, these people here are people who helped me with the data or making the data or generating some of the images. So Nathan Goldbaum did the galaxy simulation. Casper made the launch pad for the Jupyter notebooks on the last slide. Sam Walcow made the, da the MRI data. And Britton Smith did the population two thing. We're always looking for new users and collaborators. So please come talk to me if you feel like it. And with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Oh, and also this first link here, um, the monkum.github.io forward slash 2019.313 PyData is the link to the slides. So you can play around with that. All of those slides have links to various projects and stuff like that. So feel free. I've tried to make it a good resource for you if you're interested in any of this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, could you talk about the development community and like how big is it? How many people are in your group? Are there people outside? Uh, the YT development community? Yes. You mentioned. Oh, yes. OK, you yeah. You mentioned like there's an open pull request. Can you explain what that means? Oh, OK, great. So um, Patricia asked me to describe the development community, how many people are actively contributing to the project. And can I also describe what an open pull request is? Because I kind of like skimmed over that a little bit about um, the CI compliant data. Um, so the YT project has over 150, uh, like it's 126 uh, contributors of, over all time. There's several active developers. I don't know that number offhand, but we can look at the GitHub activity if we want to, um, maybe afterwards. Um, in my group at NCSA, there are at least four people who are actively developing YT. Um, and that are part of the YT project in the organization overall. Um, and so that's all the YT related stuff now I can mention. Okay, so the a pull request is, so our stuff is all hosted on GitHub. I, m I mentioned there's a link to the repo when I first did the brief introduction to YT. And so any of you could contribute to YT if you want to. So if you like have some, you know, if you have like a regular mesh structure, it's going to be very easy for you to build this custom front end because you can copy one that exists from a different regular mesh that already exists. And so when you, so when we have new people who are interested in the data, they can contribute all whatever code that they want to back 
upstream into the main YT project repository. And they do that via a pull request. And so what you say is you request that the main package that you have cloned, um, you're requesting that they pull your, uh, your data or your code into their repository, not data, whatever code you've developed. And so usually there's some limitations. So we have some um, contributing guidelines, and most open source projects do. And our contributing guidelines ask people that, you know, if you build a new feature, please add tests. This is what our test package look like. Also add an example of documentation. And so we have, this is why we have like a pretty um, large set of documentation based on some of these different front ends and stuff like that. So when you said open pull request, does that mean you're looking for a contributor or there's oh. someone working on it? Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Good. See, I like have realized that I have now a no, yeah, uh, bias here. An open pull request means that somebody has submitted code, but it hasn't been accepted into the repository yet. So like maybe they still have a feature that they're fixing. Maybe the community has identified a bug, or maybe they've submitted it as a work in progress. So I have a, I have an open pull request for a nuclear engineering simulation code called De Novo, and that's the thing I used for my dissertation data to transport radiation through space. And so I submitted uh, what's called a work in progress pull request. So I said, this is a work in progress, but I'd like you to look at it so that way I can fix things before you know, it's too late. Like if you're kind of, you're at a key point and you need feedback from the developers. And this is very helpful if you have a very distributed uh, developer base, which we do in the YT project. Question. Yeah. Uh, is there any work or plans on um, leveraging like, GPUs to accelerate this? Um, no, but however, oh yes, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, the question was, is there any existing work to use, G to leverage GPUs to do this? And no, however, we do have a uh, volume rendering, like an interactive volume rendering thing that YT works with that I didn't really cover, but I briefly mentioned exists, and I believe that uses some GPU stuff. But I'm not positive because I haven't worked on that at all. But um, yeah, no, we're not working uh, on using GPUs. Um, does it YT stand for anything? Yes, today or something like that? No, no, it is a reference to a Neil Stevenson novel character. Um, and so uh, my PI is going to be very upset with me that I don't know exactly which book, but the character is named YT. Does anybody know? Oh, whoa. Okay, well, then I'm not the only one here. Do you know? Oh, okay, sorry. It's. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between this AstroPi and uh, our YT? Ooh, yeah. So the question is, what's the difference between AstroPi and YT? So I'm not a big user of AstroPi. I'm not like an astrophysicist. Uh, but I think my the idea that I get is that AstroPi is supposed to do a lot more data processing than YT and is not meant for visualization in the same way. But I could... I don't want to weigh in on that because I don't know enough about AstroPy to like definitively say something about that. Um, one thing that your question has reminded me of, though, and that I maybe briefly mentioned, is all of so YT is meant to work in the scientific Python ecosystem. So AstroPy and YT developers work together on a lot of features because we want the packages to be compatible. You know, we don't see working in the scientific Python ecosystem as a competition, but as a collaboration. And so um, YT has some core scientific Python dependencies like NumPy and Matplotlib, and we would not be able to work on the package that we do without those projects. Um, and so I think that AstroPy has a lot of features that are very complementary to YT. And um, yeah, so like Matplotlib, I mentioned before, like all of our plots are actually Matplotlib under the hood. And so you can customize them the same way you would with a Matplotlib plot. So if you want, if you know how to annotate Matplotlib figures, you can do that with a YT figure because under the hood it is Matplotlib. Mm -hmm. uh, comment on maintainability. So you said you had uh, something like four languages all talking to each other and exchanging data. Mm. Can you comment on how that's going to scale and how you break up the pieces mm -hmm. in order to make that something that Yeah, so that's difficult. I mean, this is like something that we have to be very cognizant of as we're developing out widgets in particular. Um, and 
It's a challenge. Uh, I think what we try to do, our general practice, is to try and have all the performant parts of the code in WebAssembly and to not pass large data objects in and out of WebAssembly. We just have the upfront cost of passing the data, the full data, into the WebAssembly um, variable mesh object. And then that lives there. And we might call like something like the view center or some very small single number to update the view, but we're not passing the full data back out of WebAssembly unless we're making a new image just of that particular data. And so we try to keep all the performant things in WebAssembly. Um, we also, because we're interacting so much with WebAssembly, we have to build out more JavaScript functionality. So all those mouse clicks and stuff were done using JavaScript. We're not really interacting with Python with those. And so as a result, our widget is not as Python heavy as many other widgets are that have been built using IPy widgets. Did you find that you had a lot of the same data structures and serialization and deserialization code in multiple languages? No, no. So. Uh, we have tried to avoid that. Um, and so, yeah, we don't have like a ton of parallel stuff. Uh, however, if, if you were using just standard IPy widgets uh, with YT, like in my first example, then YT would be doing some of that serialization for you. But we're not doing that because we pass the raw data into the WebAssembly objects. So like there is some parallel there, but it's not being used by the same use case. Right, like if you're if you're making a single figure in a Jupyter notebook and you don't use widgets, then you'd be using the YT functionality. But if you're using widgets, then you're using that code, and they might look similar, sort of under the hood, but they're based on a different use case, and so you're not using them at the same time. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, that was thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>